So there's going to be one more example of an effective field theory. And this is going to be an example of an effective field theory with what looks like a problem. It's got a fine tuning. So usually the whole notion of effective field theory is against the idea that there should be a fine tuning because you're making a dimensional analysis estimates of things. If there's a fine tuning, that means your dimensional analysis failed. In this example, we'll see that you can make one fine tuning and you can understand what's going on with that fine tuning and actually propagate it to change your power counting. To change your power counting such that it, it takes into account the existence of that fine tuning, builds the whole defective theory around the idea that there was this fine tuning from an original, perhaps, di di dimension counting point of view, but that we can adopt a different power counting that actually organizes the physics in exactly the right way that we want to. And in fact, it's going to be such an easy example where we, we can just basically calculate all the Feynman diagrams, like very simply one line. Um, so that's what we'll do. It'll be a very simple example of an effective theory, field theory. And we'll prove some things about quantum mechanics that would be very difficult if we weren't using effective field theory along the way. So we'll investigate an effective theory that has a naively irrelevant operator that must be promoted to being relevant. So by dimensional analysis, it would be irrelevant. And one way of thinking about it is that it just has such a large anomalous dimension that it actually ends up being totally irrelevant. And that is actually not a bad way of thinking about it. So the example we'll talk about is something called two-nucleon non-relativistic effective field theory. So you have two nucleons, a neutron and a proton, for example. It's a bottom-up effective theory. We're not going to be thinking about calculating nucleons in QCD. We're going to work at momenta that are so small that we actually integrate out the pion. So all exchange particles are integrated out. There's nothing to exchange and really just have contact type interactions. So something that you might think of as like a pion exchange between two nucleons that's represented by some local operators between the nucleons. All right, so let me stop there and we'll come back and talk more about this theory next time. And we'll see that we can first that these operators of this type actually can organize some facts about quantum mechanics in a very nice way. And then we'll see how to think about fine tuning from this contact interaction theory. And also how to think about sort of how we want to organize the power counting, what's MS bar say, et cetera. OK. It's kind of a fun theory. So last time we were talking, we just started talking about effective field theory with a fine tuning. And what actually that means takes a little bit of discussion. So what you could mean by a fine tuning is that you have something that's irrelevant. It, you, you look at the operator, you think it's irrelevant, but it's not. It's relevant, something that you should include even at lowest order in your power counting. But saying something is irrelevant means that you have a power counting, that you understand the power counting for the theory, what the correct power counting is. So in this example that I'll give, what irrelevant will mean is that you basically do a dimensional power counting, which is how we usually think of defining irrelevant and relevant. Do a dimensional power counting, and you end up finding an operator that you find that the operator looks irrelevant, but when you do calculations, you can see that it should be relevant. And that means really what it means is that this natural power counting of dimensions is not the right one, and you have to do something more complicated. But it still is a sense in which it can be thought of as a fine tuning because, as you'll see, uh, 
the changing of the power counting from the naive one to this more complicated power counting involves kind of uh, some kind of tuning, if you like. And it really, in this case, we'll see actually that it corresponds not to expanding around the trivial fixed point where you would have a free theory, but expanding around an interacting fixed point. So it'll be a little non-trivial, but we'll be doing this in the context of two nucleon effective field theory. And the advantage of this is that the nucleons are going to be non-relativistic. So P is going to be much less than M pi. It's going to be a very simple theory. Everything that's an exchange particle gets integrated out. It's just a theory of contact interactions and derivatives of in contact interactions. And because it's non-relativistic, we can actually calculate all the loops to all orders in perturbation theory, and we'll do that in a minute. So this theory, we can calculate a lot of stuff. And so we'll actually be able to see these, this, how this non-trivial fine-tuning works and, and explore it from multiple directions, and we'll be sure that what we're saying is, is actually correct. So it can be a lesson for understanding some of the concepts in other effective field theories with the fine-tuning, which you might want to design, uh, where you don't have as much ability to calculate. All right, so let's start off with something simple, which is elastic scattering. And that's mostly what we're going to talk about. Two particles in, two particles out. Center of mass frame, they scatter to some p's coming in, p primes going out. And this is basically a problem that you could treat with quantum mechanics. It's like non-relativistic scattering. So if you have a single partial wave, then this scattering is described by a phase shift, delta. And the relation of the phase shift to the amplitude with our normalization for the amplitude is this. So this is the S matrix. It's just a phase. And that's the relation of the S matrix to the amplitude. And this thing is the amplitude. And I guess the other thing we know is that by energy conservation, the magnitude of P is equal to the magnitude of P prime. All right, so if we rearrange this equation and we write it as A and put the phase solve for A, do that. So that gives that equation, which we can rearrange a little further. conventional way of writing it. Which is that the amplitude should be given by 1 over something that's p cotangent delta, the scattering angle, or the S matrix angle, and then minus this IP. Okay, So the I of the I is just shows up here in this part, and that's the complex part of the amplitude. And it's basically going to be related to unitarity that, that IP is there. This S matrix is obviously, obviously unitary. <laughs> Steger S is 1. All right. So let me tell you something about non-relativistic scattering, which on the face of it looks kind of non-trivial. So this thing, p cotangent delta. So here I was doing a single partial wave. Yeah, OK, no, it's fine. So what is this L? This L is the partial wave I'm considering, s wave, p wave. So L is 0 for the s wave. L is 1 for the p wave. And the statement is that if you have a short range potential and you pick a wave, then this 
P cotangent delta with the appropriate power of P can be made a Taylor series expansion in P. Okay? And this is actually something that's quite difficult to prove from quantum, in quantum mechanics, this particular fact. And it's called the effective range expansion. It's difficult to prove because when you do quantum mechanics, you pick a potential. And I'm saying that this is true for any potential. So if you start doing quantum mechanics with some potential, you've got to prove that you can put it in this form irrespective of what the choice of that potential would be. And that makes it a little bit tricky to do in, in from a quantum mechanical setup. But we'll see actually that this is very easy to prove from an effective field theory setup. So as a way of getting into this effective field theory of two nucleons, let's prove this fact. So what is the Lagrangian for this theory? There's no, it's not a gauge theory. So we just have ordinary derivatives. So if you like, you can think of what I'm writing here as kind of like our IV dot D term, except I've picked the center of mass frame. And this would be like the kinetic energy term, but now it's just partial squared with no d, et cetera. And then there's a bunch of contact interactions. So there's a whole bunch of operators that are involve nucleon fields with some Wilson coefficients. The notation here is this S is kind of a pseudonym for the channel. So this S here, which is some, maybe it should be a script S or something, is telling me which channel I'm in. And if in a spectroscopic notation, you'd say it's, you're in the 2S plus 1 LJ channel. So this would be the angular momentum, total momentum, and the spin. And these operators here, for our purposes, are four nucleon fields with two m derivatives. Now, this is not really the complete theory uh, for a couple of reasons. Well, there's higher order relativistic corrections indicated by the dots. There would also be dots over here that could ha have to do with having more nucleon fields. For example, I could have, instead of just four, I could have six. But I don't need to worry about those operators for two to two scattering. So I'm leaving them out. So this is actually the complete theory, if we include these dots here, for two to two scattering. And this nucleon field is spin a half. And it's isospin a half, too. So it includes both the proton and the neutron. Nucleons are fermions. And that implies actually a relation because the wave function has to be antisymmetric. And so actually, you know that you can associate isospin and the angular momentum in the following way because of this fact. So all the isotriplets have minus 1 to the s plus l even, and the isosinglets have minus 1 to the s plus l odd. So that cuts down by a factor of 2 the number of combinations you have to consider. And basically what this theory has is for some given channel in and some given channel out, which I could in denote in general different, we get operators that just will have some power of the center of mass momentum, p to the 2m. And actually, just by angular momentum conservation, that has to be the same as that. And so all that can change is, is the l's. And so if s is 0, so there's two different possible. s is either 0 or 1, because we have two spin a half particles. If s is 0, l will be equal to l prime, because j is equal to j prime. 
and there's no shift of the spin. So that's one possibility. And if S is 1, then so S here is the same. If S is 1, then you can have L minus L prime, which is 2. So or 0. Okay, then you're shifting by one unit, and you can compensate either by having L minus L prime be 0 or 2. Okay, so we conserve J. So we can enumerate all the possible partial waves. We'll mostly focus on the S wave. So let me write out some of these operators for you. So the first operator has no derivatives. And I can write it in a way that makes the partial wave explicit if I do the following. some derivative operator. And I'm going to pick the normalization to make our lives as easy as possible, as we usually do when we're setting up the operator basis. first two guys where this derivative operator is like grad squared to the left, grad left dot grad right, plus grad squared to the right. And these p's, if you look at them, they're just matrices in the spin and isospin space. So the two we'll focus in on are the s waves. And in the S wave, you either have 1S0 or 3S1. And so we've encoded all this sort of complexity in just these matrices, which kind of just go along for the ride. Tell you what they are. So I sigma 2 projects you onto a spin singlet, and I tau 2 tau I projects you onto an isotriplet. And then likewise, 3s1, which is a spin triplet, you put I sigma 2 sigma I, I tau 2. And the I tau 2 and I sigma 2 are just because of the way I wrote the operator. I wrote it, instead of writing n dagger n, I wrote n transpose n, all dagger. And that means basically you should think about the way this operator works is it annihilates two nucleons in a particular spin wave, or particular spin isospin channel, and then creates them again. Okay, so annihilate, create. So I just put the, the two fields that are doing the annihilating together and the two fields that are doing the creating together. And that's nice because you're create, annihilating them in a particular channel. So with that, with those conventions, our Feynman rules are particularly simple. If we just have a C0 in some channel, then the Feynman rule is just minus I C0. And if we have a, one of these higher C2 operators in the center of mass frame, it's just minus I C2 P squared. This is in the center of mass frame, that's the center of mass momentum. And remember, in the center of mass frame, P squared was equal to P prime squared. And so we can actually just write down the Feynman rule for the complete set of operators there if we adopt this convention. So if you insert a guy with two m derivatives, derivatives always have to come in pairs because of uh, angular momentum. If 
You just have that fine manual summed over the seat, over the over the number of derivatives. So this is the complete in this theory. This is the complete tree level amplitude. from those interactions over there. OK, so it's a very nice theory. Simple. <laughs>